Welcome to the ITER Talks. This is the first in what we hope will be an extended series of discussions on fusion and the ITER project, and uh, hopefully for a public audience and widely disseminated. First of all, my task will be to give you the introduction to ITER, where we say it is opening the way to a new energy future. Here you can see the, uh, the ITER uh, site, the overview of the ITER site. You can see that the site is about one kilometer long and about 400 meters wide. Um, it is, uh, you, you see in the very center, the large building, the Tokamak building with the assembly hall as a unit. You see in the foreground, uh, the, the uh, ITER uh, heating systems all the way in the very, very back. You see the uh, electrical switchyard and along the far side, you see a few of the, of the factories uh, where components that are too big to ship are being manufactured here on site. We'll get into much more of those details, but before we do, I wanna talk a little bit about the logic, about why ITER, why, why have all these countries come together to build this, this uh, magnificent research machine? Why are they spending the money? Why are they investing in fusion? So, the first, is really quite obvious. Uh, we have a gigantic dilemma related to the need for clean energy. We know that electricity is the vector of civilization. It's civilizational development. We know that we have about 1.6 billion humans that are still not even connected to the grid. And we see constantly statistics about what we can expect by 2030 or 2050 in terms of the uh, additional need for, for more energy to, to fuel our, uh, our lifestyles and our needs. We want to become more efficient, but we also know that electricity has a direct relationship to development. And so the question is, how do we, how do, we do that? We also know that the use of fossil fuels is, uh, is having a huge impact on our planet because the waste from fossil fuels goes directly into the atmosphere. So the question that we really have is how do we meet a vision in which we decarbonize the production of, of electricity and actually pave the way for using electricity and other clean end uses in a much, much greater way than is used today? So how do we fuel an energy transition? There are only a few solutions. Renewables have been increasingly manufactured and put, in, put into uh, deployment in some countries more than others, but the, the, renewable, the use of renewables is ramping up. So why isn't that enough? The issue is that they are intermittent um, and they are, in other words, you know, the sun only shines part of the time, the wind only blows part of the time, but also much more importantly, they are a low power density because in effect, they are, renewables are coming from fusion. They are coming from solar energy, but at a distance of, you know, the distance between earth and the sun. And, and so automatically, the diffuseness of that means that there will be limitations for how we use renewables to power industry or mega cities or other highly intensive energy, energy uses. Fission, nuclear fission, which is really all of the nuclear power plants that are out there today, more than 400 globally, um, they have issues associated with national policies, associated with safety concerns, associated with waste disposal. And not to go into that too much, but Fusion, while it is also a nuclear reaction, hydrogen fusion has inherent advantages that we're going to talk about that make it a very promising solution as an alternative. So what are those advantages? First of all, fusion has the capability, unlike renewables, to be baseload power. It is not intermittent as we envision it in a, in a magnetic fusion device. We'll talk about ITER and the machines that will follow but fusion has the advantage of actually being a versatile replacement for fossil fuels, available all the time, day or night, and, and able to supply that intensity of energy that you need for your larger loads. It is carbon free, meaning that it does not release carbon or CO2 or any other greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. The fuel for fusion is abundant. There are two key characteristics of that. One is that um, we, we have, uh, you'll, you'll hear in a moment, we talk about two forms of hydrogen, deuterium and tritium. Deuterium is found in seawater, which means it is largely available to really all the countries of the world. And tritium is bred, we envision breeding it from lithiums, and lithium is also 
readily available in the Earth's crust. So the idea is that if we can master fusion, we really have uh, fuel for tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions of years, well, well into the, into the future of planet Earth. Fusion is safe, uh, whereas fission consists of a chain reaction, which if it's uh, too high, creates a runaway. If it's not high enough, it doesn't work. Fusion ha fission has to be maintained at just that critical element of a chain reaction with a buildup of heat, that if you lose the power to take away the heat, you can end up with a Chernobyl or a, a, a Three Mile Island uh, Fukushima. So fusion does not have that characteristic. Fusion is inherently safe. It's very hard to do, but if any element of the fusion reaction is interrupted, it simply stops, it shuts down. There's no decay heat. There is no possibility of a meltdown. The only type of accident you could have would be much, much more minor, nothing that would require evacuation. Uh, and the inventory of, of, uh, of radionuclides in terms of what would be released is very uniform, it's tritium. Um, so fusion has that advantage. It also has the advantage of being economic in a couple of ways. When it comes to the actual cents per kilowatt hour, that's usually how we compare different types of, of energy sources. In that sense, we envision it being similar to uh, nuclear fission plants, where there will be a large capital outlay followed by negligible fuel costs in the case of fusion and, and very little, uh, relatively low uh, uh, operating costs. However, there's another aspect of economics, two aspects of economics that are not always talked about. One is that when you, when you go to, when you consider the waste issue, as opposed to fission, nuclear fission, which has tens of thousands of years of, of nuclear waste to be managed, stored, et cetera, in, in, in uh, long-lived, high, highly radioactive uh, waste, fusion will not have that. The, the fusion waste, while you have some tritiated waste from the tritium used, in essence, the, the fusion radioactive products are simply the activation of the metal itself that surrounds. And that will be relatively short-lived. If you look at an envisioned uh, strategy, yes, you will decommission a fusion plant, but if you let it stand in place and do nothing with it, it would decay to be uh, uh, relatively non-radioactive in a little more than 100 years. So that is an enormous advantage of fusion. The other feature of economics, again, seldom considered, is when you think about how much have we, have we put as waste into the atmosphere from our fossil fuels. We don't talk very much about the waste from fossil fuels, but in that case, the waste comparison is really stark because that's what is impacting our planet. And finally, still on economics, is that you can consider what we have spent, what the nations of the world have spent over the last 10 years or 20 years or 100 years to position themselves for access to fossil fuels. Think of the armed conflicts. Think of the alliances that have been driven by trying to, to ensure that my country or my allies have access to petroleum resources. So from that standpoint, the economics of fusion in which the fuel is readily available for any nation on the planet, that, in an economic sense, says that fusion has really considerable advantage, advantages.